guys ready to have a Bible study? Well, turn with me over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. All right. You guys do sound awesome tonight. The, the Metro Coast men are on fire for God. That's awesome. Amen. Let's pick it up here in 1 Timothy 4, verse 15. It says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Because if you do, you will save yourselves and your hearers. You know, this is a, a, a very important scripture in the Bible. And I like this scripture because I, I, I believe in God. <laughs> let's, let's get that straight right now, all right? Like I, like, I really do. Absolutely, there is a beyond. When you die, there's going to be a meeting and a reckoning with God. And because I believe that, this is not philosophy. <coughs> it's not merely theology. It's not a great set of ideals. God's not like, hey, shoot for the stars, hit the moon, give it your best. I look at it, it's math. Because it's a fact. Math is completely indifferent to how you feel about it. Like if you go to your mathematics professor and you say, you know, I just don't feel like this is right. Like this, this is making me struggle. It's not going to change the equation a, a bit. And I see a bit of a mathematical equation in the scripture. It says you've got to watch your life and your doctrine. And obviously the doctrine it'd be talking about here is the Bible. Now this is on many different pages of scripture. It says in James 1, don't merely listen to the word, do what it says. You know, it's crazy. Like one of the most, if there's one fundamental thing that the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation is that you have to do the Bible. Sadly, we live in a time where people think, like, I don't need to even to know the Bible. I have a pastor who I pay to know that. And if there's one thing, it's like, man, the problem even wasn't that there was a Satan and there was a serpent. The problem was is that Adam and Eve really didn't take seriously the words of God. Because when that serpent came and said, did God really say don't eat from that tree? They said, yeah, man. Yeah, he said it. And he meant it. And we ain't doing it. And because they did not take God's word that seriously, we're in this predicament to this day. So here saying, okay, you have to actually make your life match the doctrine of the Bible. You're not like, hey, you're pretty close. Not like, I, I know a couple things. But you have to find the doctrine of the Bible. We're now 2,000 years later from these manuscripts actually being written. And we've seen one church in the Bible now be splintered into widely because of power and position and false teaching and all this stuff be splintered into 40,000 different variations of a doctrine that will fit to whatever you know that you want it to be. If you want the grace alone doctrine, I just grace alone. I want to focus on one element in the Bible, and that's grace. Then, then that's, there are many churches out there that will teach you that. There will be many different doctrines. We have to weave through all this craziness.
thousands of years and find out what is biblical primitive doctrine and then make sure our life matches it. And here's the thing, God allows it to be this way. It's the perfect distillery to see who's actually going to do it. Who actually wants to obey the scriptures. And we've got to make our life match the doctrine of the Bible. You know, here's the thing. This is not a new concept. This is the whole Bible. The whole Bible is God has a covenant with man. Covenant is just a re religious way of saying deal. God has a deal with man. And God establishes that deal. It was the garden, one tree, don't eat from it. We couldn't do that one thing. You had another one, Noah, build a big ark. This literally is like the church is supposed to be emblematic of the ark. And in this ark, we are going to escape judgment one day. But he had a deal with Noah. Abraham had a covenant of faith. Moses had the Mosaic law. Jesus now we have through his blood. Now we have the covenant through Christ. So it's always a covenant with man. And those covenants were always calling man back to getting their life and doctrine on straight. That was always the same call. Now, it says persevere in them. Right? So this is not a one and done. You're going to have to come back, reevaluate yourself, and go... Where is my life and my doctrine at? The key word in the scripture is if. And it's a big if. If you do. One, if you get on straight. And then if you persevere in it, here's the incredible promise. So much of the scriptures, there's a responsibility with the promise. The responsibility is you have to do this. The promise is if you do it, you will save yourself. One day you're going to breathe your last. That's a fact. And when that happens, you will go into the beyond with God. You'll save yourself. And here's the thing. You'll have an impact on the world around you. You will save your hearers. See, a true disciple, it's not just a personal thing. It's like I got my little personal relationship with God. I don't talk about it in professional settings because it's personal. One time I was sharing my faith on campus. And I go, no, no, I'm here for school. That's, I got school and I got, I got everything in different places, right? You don't talk about that here. And I, and I said, no, 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 that's not the way I read my Bible. It's, it's, it's all encompassing of my life. And here it says, man, if you do it, you'll actually save the people around you. I just want to talk about what is that covenant tonight. I want to talk about what it is, right? Let's just talk about it, right? I think as men, can you, can you handle the truth? <laughs> can you handle it? I mean, we're, we're supposed to be tough guys, right? All right. Let's just talk about the truth tonight. Let's go over here to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Where does the life meet the doctrine? What does that look like? Let's look here in verse 25 of Luke chapter 14. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. 
Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is unable to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider with his able 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able... He will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace in the same way. Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Wow. You know, this is a, a very monumental passage of Scripture. The title of it is called The Cost of Being a Disciple. And here there's a large crowd traveling with Jesus. So the words of the Bible are always so meaningful. What would this large crowd represent? It would rep represent the religious world. All those who just want to be on the big bandwagon with Jesus. All those who just want to subscribe to Jesus. Those who want to be a fan of Jesus. Those who want to say, yeah, you know, Jesus is my savior. And here he starts to distill down this large crowd into those who would get their life to match their doctrine. And here he turns around and he says, hey, I forgot to tell you guys this. When we left Galilee, uh, here's the thing. If you do not hate your father, mother, brother, sister, wife, and children, even your own self, you can't be a disciple. And if you read from the book of Acts, you know that a disciple and a Christian are the same thing. There is no difference. I know we live in a time where we have like clergy, laity, and it's like, hey, I've just started going to this church. And right now I'm, I'm just, I'm in the beginner's class and then one day I'll go to this class and then one day I'll go to that class and then one day I may actually be committed. No, that's not in the Bible. There was no clergy and lady. There was only one way, one truth, and one life. Jesus said, I am the ways, the truths, and the lives. He said, there's only one way to follow me. You want to call yourself a Christian? It means that you're actually a disciple. Now, one would go, what is Jesus saying here? I got to hate my family? Well, obviously, that would go against the Bible because the Bible says honor your father and mother, right? So what is he saying? We have to interpret the Bible with the Bible. We have to reconcile the Bible with the Bible. Now, we know from uh, Matthew's scripture, it says anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. So in the Greek, the word hate just means to love less. So Jesus here is saying that you've got to put me before your closest human relationships. That where if they would try and get you to compromise your commitment to me, man, it would seem like hatred to them on how unyielding you are. Now here's the thing, I am here tonight because somebody actually did this to me. I first started going out to church of a group of true disciples in 1996, and I would be dragged out to church by my girlfriend's dad. That man was Lance Underhill. And he would guilt me out to coming out to church every now and again, and I'd come and I'd sit in the back with my arms folded, and I just hated every second of it. And through a turn of events, my girlfriend at the time, his daughter, Got to a point where she saw, man, life with this guy is going nowhere. We're about 19 years old. And she goes, I, I, I think I promoted through my just dereliction her to study the Bible. So in a sense, she saved me, but I saved her too. And so she studied the Bible and she dumped me and became a disciple. And I remember like for the first couple days, I was like, fine. <laughs> I was like, I, 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 was, I was thinking of maybe ending it anyways. And then within a couple days, I was like, please come back, please. And I'll never forget. So my dad was coaching me at some point on how to get her back. Right? He was coaching me. Now I'm 19 years old. I don't have nothing. He's like, hey, tell her that I'm going to buy you guys your own car. 
I'm going to get you guys your own place. And so I get her on the phone. She's studying the Bible at the time. Still hasn't become a disciple yet. And I'm like Satan in the desert with her. I'm promising her all the glory of the world. And I, I remember getting off the phone. I hung up the phone and my dad goes, what happened? What did she say? And I go, dad, she's not coming back. I was like, it's like she hates me. I literally said, it's like she hates me. Now, I later studied the Bible. I, I got humble because the truth was I, I was not prepared to be alone at all. And so I got super humble and started studying the Bible, initially hoping to pair, repair the relationship. And the brother showed me this scripture. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's what happened. It wasn't that she hated me. She actually cared. She was holding on by the skin of her teeth not to compromise. But her unwillingness to compromise, the way I translated it was that she wouldn't do what I wanted her to do. Jesus was going to be the Lord of her life. And how I perceived it was hatred. And because she got her life and doctrine on straight in that moment, she got baptized. And you know who else got baptized? I got baptized November 15th, 1998. So here, Jesus says, if you're not willing to fundamentally make me your Lord, right? So if dad wants me to go right, Jesus wants me to go left, who's my Lord? Jesus. How's dad going to feel when you don't do what he wants you to do because you have a conviction in the Bible? What did Jesus say? Don't think I came to bring peace on earth, but division. Now a house will be divided against that. Father against son, son against father. Why? Because one's going to go, no, no, dad, God's calling me to go this way. He's going to know, boy, you're my boy. I tell you to go this way. You're going to know God is my father. And that's going to create division in a house. So Jesus makes it very clear. This is exclusive. I know we live in, in the inclusionary, you know, age where you can't say anybody can't do anything. How, oh my gosh, they couldn't be included. This is absolutely exclusive. Anybody is everybody. I don't know how else you could get into the Koine Greek if you want, but I don't know how else you're going to interpret cannot be my disciple. There, uh, that one's pretty clear. And so what happens to this large crowd? A ton of people walk away. I'm out, dude. I got to love you more than my kid. Out of here. The group distills down. Then he goes, all right, you guys look pretty hard line. All right, I could see it in your face. You got to be willing to take up your cross and follow me. Now, this isn't like wear the cross. Like, like, this isn't like, hey, wear a cross. I want everybody to know that you subscribe to me. No, this is, you've got to be willing to physically die. Physically die. So let's just pretend. I don't want to scare you. Let's pretend that God actually was real. And you knew that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Should you die for your convictions then? Absolutely. Like if you really actually believe that. If you knew that heaven awaited. Paul said, I would rather die and be with the Father, which is better by far. That's real faith. But I know we have the American dream. But I still want this. I still want that. And I haven't owned a Tesla yet. And I haven't, my bank account isn't where it is and all this stuff. And one day I want to have this house. One day I want to have this money. And you're just caught up in slavery. That man, we're trying to free people here to go to heaven one day. And if we really believed that, you don't have to clap, it's cool. If we really believed it, you'd be willing to die for it. And here he says, you got to be willing to die. Now, are you sure? Um, well, what happened to all the people in the first century for the most part who are Christians? Many of them died. Do you think they did that for extra credit? Do you think we look back and we go, those darn martyrs, they were just really special. And I just, I salute you, but I'm an American now. I'm an American Christian, and I think God became an American too, actually. 
and he understands my busy schedule and he understands that my life is very complicated and I can never do that anymore. No, no, no. They actually understood what it was. They understood this call. It's in the Bible. This was the covenant. And what I want to call you to tonight is to count the cost again. And that's the tell my charge for you tonight. It's time to count the cost again. Let's keep reading in verse 28. It says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost, see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule and say, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. I remember the brothers showed me this scripture back in November of 1998, and they looked at me and they said, you can't just start this, Jason. There is no one saved, always saved. Paul said at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the race, implying that finishing the race and fighting the good fight was keeping the faith. You can absolutely turn away from God. You've got to make this to the end. This is a fight to the death to stay faithful. And he says, you've got to sit down and think about this. See, Christians aren't made on street corners. Right here, read this track on your way home. And just to say this superficial prayer on your way home, and you'll be just A-OK if you do that. No, he says, sit down. you got to think about this. you got to count the cost and go, can I really make it to the end? Am I willing to commit to that level that I've got to stay faithful? He says, if you don't, Everyone's going to ridicule you, saying, wow, this dude began to build. Look at there was Ole on campus talking about, man, I'm a revolutionary for Jesus, and let me show you the truth and all this stuff. And now he's back doing all the same stuff he was doing before he started doing it. What a bunch of garbage. I don't know about you, but I came to the determination that I was an atheist when I was 11 years old. You know what? I never studied anything about astrophysics. I never studied anything about Darwinian evolutionary theory. I never studied any of those things to try and support my, my theory that there is no God. You know why I came to that determination at 11 years old? Is that every person I knew who subscribed to Christianity was a complete hypocrite. That they said this but didn't really do it. And I didn't see any power of God in their life. So I said, if that's what following Jesus is, if that is the face of this God thing, I would believe in anything other than that. Well, what's the real truth? They never sat down and counted the cost to begin with. You know, again, the words of the Bible are very particular. Here, Jesus chose a tower to illustrate, you got to make it to the end. Why do you think he chose a tower? Now, where's another prominent tower in the Bible? Let's go over to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. You know, it's amazing how the whole Bible fits together. Let's go to Genesis 11. My first point for you tonight is the tower must reach the heavens. It says in verse 1, The whole world had one language and one common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's bake bricks and bake them thoroughly and use bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the men were building. The Lord said, is if at one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come. Let us go down and confuse their language so they're not as understand each other. So he scattered them over the face of all the earth and they stopped building the city. This is why it was called Babel. 
Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. You know, this is a, a, immediately after Noah and the flood. And then Noah's children, he then says he's going to scatter his descendants over all the earth. And to keep them from having to do God's will to go to all the nations, they go, hey, we're just going to build this city and we'll build a tower ourselves that will get to heaven. Wow. And so they start to build this tower it says that they had one common speech and one language, and they were totally unified. And God says, man, if just one people would have one language from the Bible, one sound doctrine, then nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them. But then they start to build this tower for themselves. They use bricks instead of stones, which is to symbolize that a brick is made by who? A man. A stone is made by God. And they said, we're going to do this for ourselves, for our own glory. And then God comes down and scatters them over the whole earth, which is what they were trying to keep themselves from doing to begin with. Now, we, this is a, a very mysterious story in the Bible that very few people really understand what it means. What would this tower meant to represent? Well, it says in Matthew 16, when Jesus gives Peter the keys to the kingdom, he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And here the Tower of Babel was to start on earth and end in heaven. It was one of the first foreshadowings of the kingdom of God. That we are starting it here on earth. Peter opened up the door there the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And if you get bound to the church, we are building it to the heaven. It is Jacob's ladder that we are climbing all the way to the heavens. And here when, when Jesus was telling them, you can't just start to build this tower. You have to finish it. What is he saying is that you have to be willing to be scattered over all the earth. And you've got to go to every nation in this generation. We've got to finish the tower. Jesus is riding out bent on conquest. The Christian life is not just about trying to be a nice person. It's about winning the world for Christ in our generation. And your own salvation is connected to getting the job done. You know, what did Paul say in Acts 20? He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If I only may finish the task the Lord has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. See, these were voyagers. They understood. They were conquerors. They understood the call that we had to go to all nations and win the world for Christ. You know, many people from our former fellowship, they go like, what? How could this whole thing stop like that? What happened? How could this thing that was surging thousands of disciples? Guys, we used to have a, we had one service where there was 100 baptisms and one service. 100 horse troughs and one service. Can you imagine that? I mean, we, we were reaching to the highest forms of government. Nelson Mandela was invited out to church. Bill Clinton was invited out to church. I mean, we had actresses and movie stars and, and musicians. All these people were becoming disciples. It was incredible. How could it stop? It seemed unstoppable. You know who stopped it? God. God stopped it. You know why? Because we started doing it for ourselves. We didn't represent the people in the book of Acts. They didn't care about their position. They didn't care about anything. They just wanted to get the job done. They didn't care about any of that superficial stuff. They didn't care about ego. They just wanted to win the world and stay saved. That's what they're about. Here's the thing. Is selfishness is the kryptonite of Christianity. And here's the crazy thing about it. It's so easy to let it take over your life. See, we naturally want the praise of people more than the praise of God. We naturally become lukewarm. We naturally drift away. We naturally, even as leaders, become Pharisees that, be, that care about our position more than the mission. 
It organically will happen. It will take no effort for that. Instead, it will take an incredible amount of conviction to go, no, no, I'm keeping my life and doctrine on straight. Even the people that we celebrate in Psalm 126 who went back to rebuild Jerusalem in the time of Zerubbabel and they sung that they were men and women who dreamed. You know that those guys ended up in the book of Haggai? where they started building their own panel houses instead of building the, the temple of God. See, it's so natural for that to happen. You know, tonight, I think we gotta count the cost. That we've gotta get this job done. There's no idea of somehow trying to stay faithful in a lukewarm church for the next 40 or 50 years. Satan's way too smart for that. We've gotta get to these 30 churches this year. We've got to get to Ghana. We've got to get to Thailand. We've got to get to Belgium. We've got to get to Lebanon. We've got to get to Argentina. We've got to get to Vermont. We've got to get to South Carolina. We've got to get to Tennessee. We've got to get the job done. We've got to build the tower to the heavens. You know, when I planted the church in Las Vegas, i never forget. We were so excited because we heard about these plans that they were building two observation wheels on the strip in Las Vegas. And one was going to be down by Mandalay Bay, and one was right, stat, right dab in the middle of the strip. And the one by Mandalay Bay was going to have the whole inside of the observation wheel was going to be an LED screen. And it was going to be the largest LED screen in the world. It was incredible. You're going to be able to see it from the interstate and everything. The one down... In the middle of the strip, the link, they finished it. It's beautiful. It's there to, that day, to this day. The other one, they didn't count the cost. <laughs> they sunk like $50 million into it and didn't realize it was going to be like $450 million. And so there was these concrete pillars just sticking out of the ground for years and years and years, and every day when I drive by that, it was such an illustration of people who just didn't count the cost. And you ridiculed it, you laughed at it. You're like, how, like, you, you, hold on, wouldn't you do this for a living? How could you miss it by like 400 million? They didn't count the cost on what it was gonna take to get the job done. But I think tonight I'm looking at a group of men who are gonna count the cost and count it again so that we can win the world for Christ. My second point for you tonight is remember your original surrender. Let's go back to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. We're going to pick it up in verse 31. You know, someone once said that preaching is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. So evaluate which one you are tonight. Verse 31, it says, Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down to consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Wow. You remember when somebody first read this scripture to you? The only thing for me that could really describe that moment is that moment in the movie Matrix where he offers him two pills. He says, take this pill, wake up tomorrow, believe whatever you want to believe. You know, Winston Churchill said, the average man stumbles over the truth, quickly gets up and tries to forget he ever found it. So, so you could do that or take this pill and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. And so Neo takes the pill and he finds out that he's in a world war. That he's actually a slave. And there's this cosmic struggle going on. And you know what? That is the reality of your situation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you. It's the reality. And here this scripture tells us it. It says there's an army of 10,000. There's an army of 20,000. These two forces are coming against each other. This would be what you call plane warfare. You ever seen the movie Bravehearts? So on plane warfare, 
The one with the most wins. And so who would represent the, the 20,000? This would be God's army. God is going to win. That's a fact. Satan already tried to beat him in heaven, lost, came down to earth. Now we have this mess going on. And there's going to be one final reckoning, and God's army is going to win. Now, the context of the scripture is there was a large crowd traveled with Jesus, and he winnows it down by saying, you got to really put me before your closest human relationships. And he winnows it down more by saying, you got to stay committed to life. And then he goes into this illustration here. So who would be the you he's talking about? Because he says, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. The you would be everybody who is not a disciple of Jesus. And he says, here's the reality of our situation. I remember somebody laying this on me. He goes, here's the reality. You're at war with God. And here's what God's offering you. Surrender. Complete and total surrender. And they said it in a way that hopefully I captured tonight. I understood what they meant. That everything was everything. I had to be willing to give up everything. Yeah. Now, God is a king, right? These are the normal terms of surrender for any king. Yeah. That you surrender everything. And here he says, if you do not do this, you cannot be my disciple. Wow. You remember how freaked out you were? Some of you are freaked out tonight. <laughs> I can see it on your face. You're freaked out. I'm just reading the Bible to you. We're just having a, a brother's Bible study here. That's all that's happening. And I remember I was 19 years old. Uh, my eyes were like quarters. So I was like. <laughs> but then something happened. I made a decision. I go, okay. Your posture changes. Your heart rate slows down. Because you just surrender. And you know what surrender is about? Peace. That's what it's about. It's about peace. And I had peace. You know, there's a saying, it isn't until you've given up everything that you're free to do anything. And I had to give up everything. And then, you know, things didn't matter that much anymore. Isn't it a great thing? Like, like when you're like, hey, I'm ready to die, and I surrender everything, now what's going to get to me? Now what can stop you? People go like, why did the first century Christians really turn the world upside down? I mean, really the fall of the Roman Empire had so much to do with them. Why were they able to have such an incredible impact? Because they were so free. They were not afraid of anything. They weren't worried about their bills. They weren't trying to keep up with social norms. They were absolutely surrendered. Do you remember your original surrender? Here's the thing. It's not one and done. God brings you back to it time and time again in your Christian life. Back to that delegation. Back to that parlay. Back to that surrender. What does it look like? Turn over to John 15. I'm not going to preach much longer, but... Just endure this with me for a little while longer. John 15 and verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it'll be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, life and doctrine, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. 
You know, this amazing passage of scripture where Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Some branches do not remain in me. They don't keep their life and doctrine on straight. Those branches are cut off and they're thrown into the fire and burn. He goes, the ones that do actually remain in me, they keep God's word in them. He goes, those, you know what? They get pruned. <laughs> pruned. It's so against our American value system. We think that if I do good, if I'm, if I'm a good boy, and if I, if I give my contribution, and I pay my taxes, and I work hard at my job, and I'm a good husband, and I love my kids, I should get a reward. I should get a vacation. I should get a plaque that I put in my office to remind me of the, uh, the achievements I've done through all that I've worked hard for my whole life. You know what the, Jesus says you get? you get trimmed back. You get pruned. You know what the pruning is? It's back to the original surrender. God sets up a, a, a well-orchestrated series of events in your life. They usually come in the form of hardships because he's your father who wants to discipline you and train you through them so that you can make it to the end. He really works it out hard to get you to a point where you go to him and you get back to that moment that you had when you were truly freed. Some look at this and go, well, that is harsh. That is so rough. Why would God treat his children like this? I see this as a father who just won't let you go. Because you understand, even when you're knocking out your missions and you're fruitful, you're still growing away from the vine. You're still naturally drifting away from God. And God goes, no, 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 I love you too much. You've got to come back to me. And that's why I'm allowing this to happen to your life, to bring you back to that place of complete and total surrender so you can feel my peace and freedom once again. i got to ask you, is that where you're at tonight? Or do you need to go back to your original surrender. You know, there's quite a debate on the scriptures, the fruit, the fruit of the spirit, or is it the fruit of saving souls? Well, it's very clearly the fruit of saving souls. It's making disciples. God expects a harvest. It's a harvest of souls. But let's just, for the sake of argument, talk about the fruit of the spirit. You know what happens to fruit over time? It starts to rot. Has the fruit of the Spirit in your life started to rot? Has the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, has that started to spoil in your life? And if that is what is true of you tonight, then God, your Father in heaven, is trying to prune you back through this lesson to remember your original surrender. You know, I remember when I got restored in this town in 2010. I was so at peace. I didn't care about nothing. I was so freed. I just, I just wanted to do God's will. I just wanted to make it to the end. I just wanted to save souls. I just wanted to lay my life down. I wasn't worried about leadership or how do I, you know, measure up in the hierarchy of the church and all this stuff. And do people think I'm awesome? And why did he get to lead the study and I didn't get to lead the study? And here I am taking notes. Why didn't he take notes? And like, I wasn't caught up in all this garbage. I just wanted to win the world for Christ because this was the truth. It set me free. I was surrendered to whatever, and I wanted other people to have that. And here's the thing. God wants you to have it tonight. You know that it can happen before you leave that door. It doesn't have to, okay, what am I going to do when I get out that door? It can happen right now. It's just one radical decision away. Well, I got one final point for you tonight. The salty will see salvation. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 14. Most people tend to stop at verse 33. We're just going to keep going. It says in verse 34, 
Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. The salty will see salvation. Jesus takes a left turn here. He starts talking about salt. Why? Now, salt in ancient times was meant to preserve things. Remember it said, keep your life and doctrine on straight. Persevere in them if you preserve in these things. If you stay in them, they will save yourself and your hearers. So this is pre-refrigeration. And how you would preserve meats, how you would preserve things, is that you would have a big bag of salt in your kitchen in the first century. It would be like a Costco bag of salt. And as you're using that salt for food, the bottom of it would gain moisture due to the humidity, and it would lose its saltiness. And it would solidify to some degree. And so every family, every weeks or months, would have this salt that has lost its saltiness. And what would you do with this unsalty salt? Well, you wouldn't want to put it on anything that grows because salt will kill anything that is living. So you wouldn't throw it in the fields. It says you wouldn't even put it on the manure pile because you could use the manure to cultivate the soil. So if you read another account, it says it is to be thrown into the walkways to be trampled by men. Wow. Now, what is salt supposed to re represent in the Bible? It's supposed to represent your conviction, yeah. your salty convictions. You remember Lot's wife when they were leaving Sodom? She looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. Yeah. What did that mean? That she had lost her conviction. She looked back and she became salt that lost its saltiness. Wow. And here what Jesus is begging of us tonight. He's speaking to you tonight. He's saying the things that we've laid out here. If you lose these things, you will not see salvation. But if you stay salty, you will see the salvation of God one day. That's why Jesus said you are the salt of the earth. You know, tonight, God is calling us back to a covenant. He's calling us back to get, have our life and doctrine on straight. And if you are going to keep your life and doctrine on straight tonight, my brothers, take me away from this. I'm just a messenger. This is just the Bible. If you are to take and get your life and doctrine on straight and keep it on straight, it's going to take every single one of us counting the cost again. I love you guys very much.